This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. At least six people are killed in clashes in Sudan just hours after an agreement between protesters and the military on a future government. We were shouting, peace, 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 strengthen the barricades. But then the lights were cut and they opened fire. You search me and I search you. The Nigerian police blog advising the public how to behave if they are arrested. Zimbabwe sets aside millions of dollars to compensate white farmers, but will it end the land redistribution controversy? Also in the program, brought back from the brink of extinction, how the Togo slippery frog is being protected as an endangered species. And in sports, Algeria's Riyad Mahrez says he will not seek a move away from Pre Premier League champions Manchester City. Thanks for joining us on Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Now, just hours after a breakthrough in negotiations over the structure of a new government in Sudan, clashes erupted on the streets of the capital Khartoum between security forces and protesters. At least six people were killed and dozens injured. The protesters blamed the military for shooting on them, but the army, which till now has avoided using live ammunition, blamed it on what they called and identified elements. Alistair Lethed has more. The crack of gunfire across Khartoum. It's the first time since President Omar al-Bashir was ousted that military units have turned their guns on protesters. This is Nile Road, a major route through the city. Demonstrators moved here amid frustration as talks for a new civilian-led administration appeared deadlocked. But they were met with more than just warning shots. Military units burst through the barricades and opened fire. This man didn't know which part of the military they were from. People died here, he said, because we were trying to protect our revolution. The nearby hospital was overwhelmed by the injured. Uh, multiple bullet injuries to the head, chest and abdomen. Yusuf was shot three times in his legs. One bullet struck his mobile phone. He blamed the rapid support force, the mobile military units that have been the main presence on the streets under the direct command of the second most senior general. The injured kept coming, most of them with gunshot wounds. There were many people, this man said, all of them unarmed civilians. We were shouting, peace, 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 strengthen the barricades, but then the lights were cut and they opened fire. What's surprising is the timing of the crackdown. Just hours before, the ruling generals and the protest organizers announced they'd agreed on the structure of the new administration. The military transitional council denied responsibility and blamed rogue units for trying to destabilize the peace process. <laughs> The names of the dead and injured were read out for friends and relatives who'd gathered outside the hospital. The shooting of protesters has made them even more determined to stay on the streets, keep up the pressure on the military and push for the real and meaningful change they're demanding. Alice Alith, BBC News. Well, to understand more about the latest violence, I caught up with my BBC Africa colleague, Mohanad Hashim, who's just returned from Khartoum. According to the Transitional Military Council, they lay the blame on this violence on the fact that they and the pro-democracy, freedom and change forces are very close to reaching a deal and that there are sabotaging and infiltrating elements and remnants of the former regime who are adamant at sabotaging any breakthrough. However, if you speak to the protesters and eyewitnesses and people who were on the ground, they are adamant that it's the Transitional Military Council by using the rapid support force to try and beat them into submission. But does the ousted president still have a strong support base? I wouldn't say that he has a strong support base, but there might be some 
people who, who, who would look back at Umar al-Bashir's period. Many people would call them opportunists or um, his, his, his former party, the National Congress Party, its, its membership rank and file. Does, would he have su support if he goes on trial? We already are seeing reports suggesting that some lawyers are very happy to defend him. So an announcement was made yesterday by the military and the opposition coalition and people are wondering what are the sticking points. It's interesting you say this. There hasn't been a major shift. We're still the key sticking points, according to the statement made yesterday, are still the makeup of the sovereign state council. How many will be civilians and how many will be military men, as well as the duration of the transition period, whether it will be four years or the two years that the military is suggesting. Is there anything like a civilian military balance of power? It's interesting. As if listening and judging by what the protesters on the streets are saying and the, and the forces backing them that a civilian transitional government is the only guarantor for a democratic system and for accountability for all those accused of crimes against the Sudanese people. Now a balance of power between the military and the civilians, judging by yesterday, the civilians have their bare chests unarmed and maintaining a pacifist approach to all this, this uh, through this uprising. The military on the other hand, they want, whether they want to go back to their barracks or they want to govern, it's not yet clear. What is life like, Mohanad, in Khartoum at the moment? It's very difficult if you are a resident of Khartoum these days. You have to keep in mind there are long uh, ATM queues for cash, people are only allowed to withdraw up to 2,000 pounds a day, which is the equivalent of $20 a day. There are electricity shortages, water shortages, long petrol queues, huge traffic jams, and the price of commodities haven't exactly been coming down. My colleague Mohanad Yashim there. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. High school students in Somalia have been demonstrating in the capital Mogadishu over the postponement of their national exams. The government delayed the tests after papers were leaked and sold on uh, social media. The government says exams will now take place at the end of May and social media will be shut down for five days to curb the illegal circulation of papers. Now, Zimbabwe is currently experiencing its worst blackouts since 2016. The authorities blame it on the reduced output and the hydroelectric plant, mainly the result of a drought which has lowered water levels at the dam. And the government has pledged to import more power from neighboring Mozambique and South Africa. WhatsApp is urging over a billion users around the world to upgrade to the latest version of its messaging service after the discovery of sp spyware uh, that can monitor people's calls. WhatsApp says the malicious uh, software uh, was developed by an Israeli company and was mainly used to spy on human rights lawyers. Now, what would you do if you were stopped at a checkpoint or arrested by the police? In Nigeria, authorities have been sharing tips on Twitter, uh, telling citizens how to interact with officers. Uh, some of the suggestions include politely asking to search an officer before he searches you in order to prove they are not trying to plant something on you. Now, the tips have certainly got people talking. Uh, let's take a look at uh, some of them now. Do not resist arrest even if uh, you believe that the arrest is illegal or uncalled for. Never try to touch an officer in an unfriendly manner. He may suspect you of trying to disarm him. Now, do not use your phone indiscriminately while being arrested. The deputy commissioner for police in Lagos shared uh, the ideas in a blog, so we asked people there what they thought. It's a work on development. It's a thing that we... Nigerians, individuals should be educated about how to interact with police uh, as in like being polite because they are doing their job. Nigerian police is not good to relate with them at all. They are very bad. The public must always cooperate with the police. They are, they are for our safety. We must always be polite with them, cooperate with them in any issue. You see, but uh, nowadays, because of people's uh, character, they do whatever they like. You should just give them the, the credit because it's not easy. Even under rain or sun, they do try. 
So I too, before police search me, I must ask him, ask him or her to open his or hand so for me to look. And let the people know their rights. If you know your right that no policeman has the authority to search you without you, first of all, conducting a search on the policeman, there won't be a problem. Formerly they say police is our friend, but as things goes, they turned out to be enemies to some people because of the system we are in. Some interesting thoughts there. Well, let's go to Abuja now, where the BBC's Ishak Khalid is standing by. What prompted this move by the police, Ishak? Well, basically, Sophie, the Nigeria police has acknowledged that the relationship between its personnel and the citizens is not okay. And um, recently, there were cases of extrajudicial killings, particularly in Lagos in southern Nigeria. Um, one of the most uh, widely circulated and talked about case was that of a young man, Kolade Johnson, and that has really prompted outcry and once again echoed the kind of uh, treatment Nigerians complain about, uh, you know, how the police are treating them. And then secondly, th th there is the issue of uh, insecurity in Nigeria. It appears that the Nigeria police is trying to win the confidence of the citizens. Um, there is the issue of kidnapping across the country, the issue of clashes between farmers and herders, as well as communal clashes. So there is the issue of uh, gathering intelligence. Because of the mistrust between the police and the citizens, the issue of intelligence gathering has been facing difficulty, according to many security experts. And then another reason, possibly, is that um, Nigeria police has a new inspector general. So because the, the, the image of the Nigerian police personnel is, is so bad in the eyes of many citizens, um, he's trying to show that he is a new person, he's going to lead a new police command, a police force in Nigeria, that the personnel under him are going to be different. So uh, this is, these are some of the reasons why the Nigerian police are doing that. But they have acknowledged, of course, that the relationship between the personnel and uh, citizens is not okay. So, so there appears to be some sort of reforms going on. And we've been getting plenty, plenty of reactions from people, not only in Nigeria, but across, uh, across the continent. Some saying, look, these tips should also be focused on the police. The police should be um, also given some tips on how to handle the public. Have there been any reactions from the police themselves, uh, the, the unit itself, about uh, the, uh, the response from the public? Well, basically, the Nigerian police uh, officers are reassuring the citizens, saying that um, they are out to make things better. Uh, they have been reassuring them, but of course, there is still mistrust. And the Nigerian police has come under heavy criticism from international human rights organizations in recent years. Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, as well as local um, human rights activists because of the kind of uh, treatment the citizens are, are, are facing in the hands of police, roadblocks, checkpoints, when arrested, and so on and so forth. And then the issue of corruption, bribery, and extortion, so many complaints about the police. But the command, the, the force is saying that um, things are going to be better. But Nigerians are, of course, watching. And then about these tips in particular, many people are saying, of course, they are helpful. The citizens will know how to relate with the police. The police should also be educated. And then, but many people are saying the practicability of these tips uh, is something that uh, many people doubt because if, if the police uh, violate the right of the citizens, the process of seeking redress is quite slow, it's quite cumbersome, and it's quite right. difficult. Many Nigerians, particularly in rural areas, may not be able to, uh, you know, endure that. Right, right. It's Khalid in Abuja for us. It will be interesting to see what impact these tips will have. Now, this focus on Africa from BBC World News is still to come. It's been 43 years since Morocco won their one and only Africa Cup of Nations tournament. Could this year be their second time lucky? We hear from their cup team. I'm Sophie Ikenye and you're watching Focus on Africa from BBC World News. The top story on this program... The military in Sudan have denied uh, being responsible for shooting dead five protesters and an army officer uh, during clashes in Khartoum. Is Zimbabwe inching towards ending the controversial land takeover of white-owned farms? Well, farmers' representatives say a new commitment marks a significant step forward. The government will make an interim payment towards the billions of dollars that the farmers claim they are owed. 
Western countries have made compensation a condition to lifting sanctions. The BBC's Shinga Inyoka reports from central Zimbabwe. It's a far cry from the multi-million dollar farming operation he once owned. But David Wakefield is starting over, aged 72 and on a small rented plot. These distant hills sit on a sprawling 2,000 hectare farm he was forcibly moved from to make way for a black farmer. For years, the aging group of farmers have waited for compensation. The promised interim payment of just $20,000 each is a fraction of the two million David believes he's owed. Yes, it's, it's a step in the right direction. It'll help you pay your medical or put food on the table in the interim because a lot of people now, we've lost pensions, we're unemployable. Tractors and irrigation pipes left behind won't be compensated. Emerson Manangagwa's government will only pay for infrastructure like buildings and dams, and most controversially, it won't be paying for the land. This is the area where some of the fiercest battles over the land were fought. Locals coordinated attacks from the mountain ranges behind me on the first settlers. Some of their graves remain here today. It's one of the reasons why land ownership and compensation remains such a contentious issue. Yeah. It's here on some of the country's best soils that we found new farmer Baldwin Mazango. Like all land takeover beneficiaries, he pays a small tax that will go towards compensation. He believes that the farmers should be paid, but only for the improvements. If you want to put it into this money, some of them paid a dollar or two dollars a hectare. It was just token payment, if I can be very frank. You know, it cannot be said that uh, it was payment to the real value of the land. Because I would say, you know, my forefathers have to be compensated now for, being, for them being forcibly removed from where they gained their, what, their uh, livelihoods. Zimbabwe says any payment will have to come from former colonial powers. So if we are to say, which we are not going to do, we are going to compensate for land, no government will stay, will stay in power because the people don't want to pay for colonialism. Farmers are expected to begin receiving the interim relief within months. But with the dilemma of competing interests across the racial divide, it's unlikely it will end the conflict over land ownership in Zimbabwe. Shingai Nyoka, BBC News, Mazowe, Central Zimbabwe. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport. Peter. Many thanks, Sophie. Algeria's Riyad Mahrez says he will not seek a move away from Premier League champions Manchester City this transfer window. Mahrez, who became the club's record signing last year at a reported $78 million, started only 14 league games this season as Guardiola opted for Raheem Sterling and Leroy Sané on the wings. The Algerian has chipped in with seven league goals and four assists this season, including one in the 4-1 win at Brighton and Hove Albion that sealed the title and says he will not shy away from the competition for a starting spot. Meanwhile, the season over or almost over in leagues across Europe, many African players are now turning their attention to next month's Africa Cup of Nations in Egypt. Morocco have only won the competition once. That was way back in 1976. This year, they will play in a rather tough Group D alongside Ivory Coast, South Africa and Namibia. But captain Mehdi Benatia says they have amb big ambitions for the tournament. I think we all have a chance to get through the first round. We know that our group is a very competitive one. Everyone describes it as the group of death. It is a very competitive group with Ivory Coast, who we faced many times, and definitely they want revenge. We have big respect for the three teams. All the teams are well prepared and they want to win the tournament also. We will have a say on the field. We will give everything to make our supporters happy and proud. 
But spare a thought for the next two players. Sierra Leone was banned from the competition due to the long-drawn football politics in the country. They've been, uh, these players have been telling the BBC Stanley Quenda how disappointed they are to miss out on the tournament for reasons way beyond the field of play. Alaji Sise made the decision to play for Sierra Leone last year in August. He could have played for Gambia or England, but his dream was to help the Leon Stars qualify for its third Africa Cup of Nations tournament. That dream was alive until Sierra Leone was disqualified from the 2019 Africa Cup of Nations qualifiers because of government interference in the country's football association. I'm disappointed, sad, mad. Um, I think we should be there, but because of the way situation go back in our country, so that's why we're not there. Can't believe that we're supposed to qualify. I do cassava leaf now, nah, I like Jellof. That's my favourite. Yeah, Jellof is my favourite. His favorite. counterpart, Osman Kake of Queen's Park Rangers, was equally disappointed. Yeah, it was definitely upsetting. Like, obviously speaking to all the other boys, we was all a bit, like, disheartened about it. But it's one of them things where it's out of our hands and hopefully the country will resolve the problem because football is the key in our country and me going away with the national team, I was really... Like it was a whole different experience and I, and I realised that this, we could actually make a change to the country if we would have qualified. And uh, that's all you suppose. By the way, Sophie, who will you be supporting at the Nations Cup? Well, do, do you want me to support Morocco because we've mentioned it today? Or well, what? Kenya are playing, you know. <laughs> I know you're going to roast me about Kenya. We'll do our best. We'll do our best. Thanks for the support, Peter. Thank you. Now, it was feared extinct, but the Togo slippery frog was rediscovered just over a decade ago. And now, thanks to a team of scientists, the first protected area for the endangered, endangered amphibians has been established in Ghana. Now, the scientist behind the project is Caleb Ofori Boateng. The BBC's Rene Bisohong went to meet him here on a visit to London. We are talking about a black frog with yellow shiny eyes about the size of my palm. That lives entirely in streams and waterfalls. You can hear its unique whistling call, which goes a bit like, I can try? Yeah. Like. It's that so sounds amazing. Like a bird. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a bird, really. To hear this whistling coming right from a stream is really mm -hmm. amazing. What makes uh, the Togo slippery frog so special? <laughs> the Togo slippery frog, of course, like all other frogs and animals, play a very key role in the ecosystem. Basically, they are a very important source of food uh, for other organisms, and they also prey or eat other animals. And this is very important ecologically that so many times we take it for granted. Um, for example, when you don't have frogs in the ecosystem, um, it means that um, snakes and other animals will not have food to eat. In the same way, they also feed on mosquitoes. And if you come from um, sub-Saharan Africa, like I do, uh, where so many children die each year because of malaria, then you really appreciate uh, the impact that these frogs have in controlling the numbers of uh, mosquitoes uh, that we have in, in the system. You mentioned the fact that they're almost extinct. Do we know how many are there? Only a few hundreds were known. But thanks to the research that we've done, we now estimate between 500 to 800 individuals to occur in the area we are working on. The lands that we are protecting to save this species was entirely donated by the local communities. And something that I really treasure, because these are lands that they could use to feed themselves and their families, but they have donated it for the protection of a frog species. Um, something uh, very remarkable. Caleb Watang there. Well, don't forget you can get in touch with me and the rest of the team on Twitter. I'm at CKNY. Well, that's focus on Africa for now. Thank you for your company.